I'm going to be taking more of an, a, a practical approach as opposed to the law information that you got from Julie this morning. Um, my goal is to make this more practical and talk about issues and talk about ways that individuals can work on the specific issues and address this. And, and, and I'm more on the day-to-day -day focus and talk about what's going on. Some quick background on me, um, just so that you have some sense of where this information is coming from, is I have a book coming out in a couple weeks. It's a 2020 summary of all the major cases across the nation. And I uh, did this with Mitch Yell and a colleague at the University of Arkansas. Uh, so we have, this is coming out in a few weeks. Um, I, don't worry, I'll show some other books, things like this. But I, what we did is we looked at all the major cases, and this is kind of a summary. And additionally, I was involved, uh, I'm a former due process hearing officer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, I stopped being a hearing officer because of insurance requirements. Um, I was a part-time hearing officer, and my insurance went from $360 a year to $18,000 a year because I had been involved in over 600 due process hearings. So I stopped doing that because I also got to spend more time with my kids who were in high school at the time. I now work with school districts who have been sued. Um, I was heavily involved in 85 due process hearings in the last calendar year. Uh, I have not been involved in a due process hearing since about 12.20 today. So I'm on break. And so hopefully, um, no, I've turned my phone off and hopefully I won't get any more calls through the day. I am, I'm, I'm consulting with a district at 6 and another one at 10 tonight. Um, I do a lot of work for the Guam School District, which is 14-hour time zone difference than us. So I'm helping them with a thing relating to BCBAs. Uh, well, it'll be there tomorrow by the time I get there, because um, Guam starts earlier than we do. So I'm heavily involved in things uh, on a regular basis. And so, the, so what I want to highlight is some of the main issues that we saw from that law manual that you see here, but also just from things that I'm seeing. Um, and what's was really interesting, as some of you heard me talk about this before, is that I, I live in Pennsylvania, and schools in Pennsylvania start either today or tomorrow. You guys have been going to school for months, and so it's a, a lot of uh, pressing calls and trying to get things working. All right? Another thing I'm, I'm, sh I'm shilling, I'm shilling this, I don't get any money for this, is a book for the, from the Council for Exceptional Children. It's a school board member's guide to special education. School board members don't know anything about special ed, and yet they're having to make informed decisions about this. Uh, my understanding is the state of I uh, Alabama just bought a copy for every school board member, as is the state of Idaho. Uh, it just came out about four weeks ago. It's not that expensive, and again, I don't get any money for it, but it's a way to help, uh, help school board members understand what they have to do as a part of the process. I uh, co-author this with the State Director of Special Education from Montana, and she and I have done some writing projects together, and it just it works out really well. But it's something that it, you need to think about this, because school board members often campaign on how much waste they can cut, but they don't actually think about the obligations that they have relating to kids with disabilities. And that poses a significant problem because they don't say, well, can't we just suspend this kid? And if you suspend this kid, we often then have to send the kid to a more expensive placement. They don't think that of that as an option or what's going on. So um, it's just a variety of information relating to this. Okay? So what I've got is a series of topics that I'm going to be covering as a part of this. And again, trying to get more real with you as opposed to, and more kind of, so you understand the roles that you play and, what's in, and what to address as a part of this. Um, so the first issue I'm going to talk about is bullying, okay? a hot topic out there. I'm involved in multiple cases of bullying right now where kids uh, were bullied um, or there was reports of kids being bullied. And so what, what my first advice before we get to this at all is that whatever you do, uh, we're having some sound issues, right? I apologize, is whatever you do, take every single alleged incident of bullying seriously. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about this in a minute, but just that is if you learn nothing else about bullying, truly take it seriously. Truly, it, it's, 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 it is one, one of the things that we need to pay attention to. So make sure that you train your staff and talk about this, okay? So one of the things we have to talk about is we want kids to make sure that they're making meaningful educational progress. And is bullying preventing this? And why I'm addressing this is I, I just did a review for a school district where a kid uh, alleged, the parents alleged the kid was being bullied and did not make progress. The kid did, uh, started getting stomach aches, did not want to get on the bus, did not want to come to school. Our grades started plummeting. 
And so what's interesting about this is that at the, the problem is at no point did the school district see any bullying instances. Did they see anything? They, and they were looking at this. Uh, no one told the district to pay attention to this. Parents now want a private school placement because she can't function in school. But it's, it's, it, it's something we have to think about. So whenever you hear about this, so this is something you need to make sure you train school bus drivers, you train general education staff, you train everyone about this. That if you see instances of bullying, you need to report this up and make sure others are aware of this, okay? So what, is the, what are the steps? The school officials plus your IEP team, you need to look at the impact of the bullying on the student on both the academic and non-academic. Not just the academic, because too often we just look at grades. Kid is doing fine grade-wise. No, we need to think about, are they participating in school? Are they interacting with others? We have some kids who are afraid to walk down certain halls in your buildings. We have some kids who will refuse to go to certain places in a lunchroom because others are bullying them or making fun of them. So you need to look solely not just at the academics, but also com completely look at the uh, non-academics. Okay? And then make sure as a part of this, a meeting to determine the impact of the disability, not just the punishment for other students, is it impacting the kid's disability? Is it impacting what's going on as a part of their program? And again, academics and non-academics. And too often we solely focus on one. Okay? But here's, the, here's the, the kicker on this one. Is one thing we need to think about. Is the kid making progress? That is our ultimate goal. Is we want the kids to make progress. If the kid is not making progress, then we, we're not doing what we're, we're supposed to be doing. So we have to think about, is an evaluation necessary or a re-evaluation necessary? Right? And one thing we have to think about as a part of this is, is what can we, do we need additional information as a part of this? Is this something that we can do that can be of assistance that will provide and help and help address what we are with this? Okay? What additional information is necessary? Is, is it a behavior, is it a behavior rating? Is it information from the parents? Is it information from the teachers? Who might have information on this? Try to do, talk a wide scale as a part of this, okay? Now, one thing we also think about, that, that's just part of the services, but also then think about placement. One thing, if you need to think about this, what I think, okay, is before I, I should talk, put, put this in the highlight, do not victimize the student anymore. Just do not victimize, because too often what we do is we have a kid who's being bullied, we automatically change that kid's placement. We change that kid's placement. We pull that kid from whatever friends, social group they may have because they're being bullied. What we have to think about is not victimize them anymore and see what we can do to provide them appropriate supports and not, not is it necessary? Okay. Is change necessary? Change may be necessary. But we have to think about what can we do so that they're not victimized as a part of this and so we can address it where we can go with this. But at all times, all times, focus on the least restrictive environment as a part of this. Okay. So when we talk about this is not in unfairly punish the kid or send the kid to a separate placement, but keep this in mind as we address this. Okay? But one other thing, all right, is I'm seeing changes to kids' programs without prior witness. This is still under the bullying thing, okay? Is make sure that you keep the parents fully informed about all things that are being occurring, all changes, all discussions. Uh, because it's, it's incredible what creeps up when you involve the parents. As a parent of a child with a disability, I mean, I knew things about what was going on with the kid. But I, it wasn't until, oh yeah, we, when we were at the meetings that I would be prompted on something, that I would bring, bring some information in. Make sure the parents are fully informed about this, okay? But last, okay? Take, make sure, not last, but make sure you train all staff. Just train all staff relating to potential issues with bullying. Because when I'm doing this analysis for districts, I'm looking at all the staff. I'm not just going directly to the director of special education. I'm looking at, I'm getting, I'm having to get affidavits from all the teachers. I'm having to get statements about what's going on. So make sure anyone and everyone who interacts with us, coaches, teach, uh, uh, paraprofessionals, what did they see, when did they see, what were they aware of of these kinds of things. Make sure you train all staff. But also train all staff, okay, that they need to report up Report up about what's going on. Because by reporting up, or just talking to others, 
I can't tell you how many times I was involved in due process hearings in the past few years where they, there was a teacher who knew about a kid who was being bullied, truly knew, and would try to provide supports, but then did not tell anyone else about this. Okay? Again, the law looks at very much when you knew or should have known. The district knew, and the teacher who knew about this was the actor in charge of what's uh, the losses, actor in charge of this. They knew what's going on. The district should have been aware of this. Make sure you're reporting and taking about this, okay? But make sure we also are monitoring the student and doing what we can to support where we are with this, okay? okay? 504, yeah, you may think about this. If the kid is only has a 504 plan and bullying, we'll get to 504s in a minute. If a kid has only a 504 plan and they're, they're being bullied, make sure you think about the perpetrators and what they're doing for this child and you're providing this. But talk about this. But investigate all complaints and take seriously. Okay? And I, I, really, I really do mean this. Investigate all complaints, especially, especially issues of any kind of bullying, any kind of sexual harassment, any kind of sexual assault. So you take this very seriously. And you, and you prevent this. And I, some of you heard me here in the previous session. I'm involved in a case where a girl was sexually assaulted, ninth grade girl with sexually assaulted with intellectual disabilities, and they put the perpetrator back in the room next to her after a three-day suspension because they did not have another placement for him. I think over COVID this past year, we've shown that we can do placements alternatively with kids. So, that, so they said there was just not an option available. And was, there, were, there were options available. That girl suffered a lot as a result of that. And I, I, I don't blame the parents for pushing that, okay? Um, but other, okay? Address problem behaviors. Don't wait for additional problems. Don't wait for additional problems, okay? Make sure the student feels safe. This is your obligation. This is your obligation. So uh, a few of us were talking at lunch about uh, Office of Civil Rights complaints. I do uh, complaints, I do investigation complaints for the Office of Civil Rights. And one of the things we look at as a part of this is did, uh, did, how seriously did the district look at this? What did they pay attention to? Did they, they do steps? What did they do to, to initiate steps on this? Did they train the staff? What did they do to make sure the student felt safe? And too often what the districts do is nothing. They too often do nothing, okay? Even if the kid was bullied, that's, I mean, think about this. Even if the kid does get bullied, what steps did you take after learning this? Yes, you, I mean, you can't prevent all situations. You truly can't prevent all situations. And I wish we could prevent all situations of bullying, but you can't and things like this, right? Next, Section 504, changing topics, okay? Section 504. This has been rearing its head rather dramatically. And this is something that you need to pay attention to. And it was just, I understand it was just posted, they told me this a few minutes ago. Um, I have a questionnaire. Uh, so if, if those, of you, those of your districts that are starting to require individuals to wear masks, and, um, and there are a number of your districts are starting this, and you have a kid that if the, because of a medical issue, whatever issue, cannot wear a mask, you are now on notice that that kid has a suspected disability. You have to think about, is it, is, and so you have to strongly consider that as a child find step that you need to cons uh, think about. Does this kid have a disability where they either need a 504 plan or even an IEP? So don't just say, check yes, no, whether they have a mask or not. Check and determine whether that has a disability where they need accommodations, okay? Another document, I don't have it here. It's a document that I have that I think has also been posted. It's how to write a Section 504 plan. Um, it's, um, it's a 62, 63-page document on, on the steps on how to actually write one because we're seeing individuals who are writing 504 plans who don't have a clue what to, how to do this. And it goes through what, it, what is really important about this. The first eight or nine pages of how to write a 504 plan. But then, for instance, it goes through, the various dis it goes through I think, 30 different disabilities. And for each disability, it gives you 25 to 30 possible accommodations for those disabilities. It's not a checkoff list. It's not like check, 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 check. It has to be individually determined about what the kid needs. And so we're going to be revising that in the spring, but it's, it, but it's been used by 13 states as, uh, and two territories on how to write 504 plans. So, uh, but it's, it's available for you, things like this. Important components, okay? I'm going to skim through Section 504 because I just want to highlight some things that we've often forgotten about 504 that I've seen just in this past year. 
The first thing is 504 applies not just to the kids. It applies to the parents. It applies to the staff. It applies to any activities you have on your school property. Now, it doesn't mean that when you have a parent who comes in saying, I, where's your 504 plan? We don't have to provide accommodations. You provide accommodations, you make everything accessible. And now, this is going to become an interesting part of this process because as many of you over this past year and a half have become one with either Zoom, Google Hangout, um, Teams, whatever, whichever platform you so choose. Um, I like FaceTime, but it's because um, it's usually my kids who I'm talking with. Whatever it is, it's like you have to think about how can we get them to participate? And what's this a part of this? My bit of advice, my bit of advice to you, and I'm dealing with this with a number of school districts, is just if you're Zooming with a parent in a part of a meeting or hang out, whatever your thing is, assume it's being recorded. Just flat out assume that it's being recorded, all right? And so you should keep a recording of yours of it yourself, all right? Just keep the, just, so if you're Zooming with a parent, things like this, just assume. Even though you may ask, is this being recorded? And they say no, make the assumption that it is, all right? For those of you who are recording meetings, okay? Um, this, this, is, this is what I use when a lot of contentious IEP meetings, and I only get to go to the contentious ones. I have an app on my iPhone for face-to-face -face meetings. The app is called Rev.com. I don't know how many of you have used this. Right? It's, a record, it's a recording thing. It's, I don't get any royalties from this one, things like this. It's an app on your iPhone. You put, it, you put your iPhone in the middle. I, don't, I, don't, I do not know if there's an Android version. I apologize. Um, you put the phone in the middle of the table, it records the meeting. When you're done, you press upload, and then you get a PDF of the meeting within about 45 minutes. Yes, you pay per page, but you get a you get a, basically you get a transcript of the meeting. And so for parents, and for some of these contentious parents are, are parents uh, need some parents need a transcript of the meeting. Some of these parents want to record these meetings. And so, and, and again, I only go to the contentious ones. The meetings I go to, we typically have a, a, two attorneys on the phone, a, a, a consultant for the district, a consultant for the parents. And this is what we get as part of this. We just, and we just accept this as the, as the document, things like this. Um, it's not someone who's sitting there typing along what's going on. It's all um, computer generated from the sounds as much as possible. So there may be some names that are misspelled, things like this but it's the best thing I've seen out there. But within 45 minutes, you get a transcript. And so, it, it, it's, it's an, and it's easy. It's really easy. Just, put, just click Rev, type, put, it on, put it on the table. When you're done, just press, just press Upload, and it, you, it, seriously, you get an email. So by the time the parents often get home, they have a transcript. So I email them the copies. So just as a way of, of getting them to participate. Now, should you record all the IEP meetings? No, because it often feels like it might stifle the conversation and stifle the creativity of what's going on. But you have to think about this. For, for Zoom meetings, other things, just make sure it's a recording. But you have to, so 504. I'm just going to go through some really basics on 504 just because we too often forget these. You get no money for 504. Okay? Too often districts say, Where, where's my 504? You get no money for 504. I, I wish I could do. I wish I could do this. Things like this. All right. Five hundred four is also okay, sure the students have an opportunity to benefit from the education. It's an access act. It's an access getting kids in the door. Okay. Five hundred fours make up only. I've looked at your statistics. Only about two point four percent of your school age population. It's not a big big thing. But for the parents who have kids who have need a five hundred four, it's a big thing to them. So take it very seriously. My son had a 504 plan. Okay? Uh, allowed him to, because uh, he had a, had a bike injury and uh, from, uh, hit his head. And so he had, was on a reduced schedule where he couldn't go in until 11 in the morning because he was having trouble sleeping. Okay? Uh, he loved it. But we told him we had to, actually had to start getting into school. He was a senior in high school at the time. Had to go in earlier. That's when, that's when, that's when the, he got upset. But it was interesting about this, but it was, it was an important part of the process. It allowed him to access his education. Okay? More on 504. Okay? You just have to provide whatever accommodations are part of this. 
Now, there's, for, for private schools that accept um, money for free or reduced lunch or CARES Act money also have to provide 504 accommodations. And that's pissing them off. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. It, it's, it's upsetting. I did, a, I did a workshop for a group this summer, and they were fine. Do we really have to do this? Yes, you do. You accepted federal money as a result of this. You need to provide accommodations. It didn't say, yes, it did. Okay? So it, it's, it's an important part of this. Okay? The difference between 504 and IDEA, okay? There are some subtle differences. Remember, for IDEA, it's a two part test. First, you have to have a disability. Second, you have to have the need of specially designed instruction or a special ed teacher. Kids eligible under 504 do not need a special education teacher. Okay? They have a disability. And I'm going to give you three egregious examples that you can take back to your teams to help them understand so that they can understand this. Three examples. My son, when he went to high school, it was a very long high school from one end to the other. But he had a kid, in, a good friend of his, who was missing his left leg as a result of a bad car accident. Um, that, and the kid was doing fine academically, doing fine socially. He had three accommodations, three basic accommodations. The first accommodation was is that he got to leave. He used crutches to get, to get from place to place. He would leave his class um, three minutes early and, so that he didn't have to participate with all the kids in the, the rest of the hall. Okay? Because sometimes the halls, I don't know if you've been in a high school hall lately, they get crowded and they're not paying attention to a kid with who's using crutches because kids right now in halls are, what, what are they doing in halls in high school? They're multitasking, right? Checking their phone and making out at the same time. It's truly impressive. Uh, things like this. It's, it's, it's a good skill. But they're not paying attention with a kid with crutches. So then he had three minutes to get to his class late. That was fine. Second accommodation is he got a second set of books at home so he didn't have to carry books to and from school. And the third accommodation was is that he didn't have to run the mile in gym class. Okay? Basic accommodations. My son being the joker he is, he was, the kid was at our house, said, well, if he's only got one leg, have him do the half mile. And the kid, the kid actually did it, and he did fine. He, was, he thought it was funny, so he did it anyway, things like this. He did not need a special education teacher to walk for him. But what he needed was some basic accommodations to make it through the day. Second example, a girl I worked with uh, two years ago, right before COVID, she had what's called MCS, or multiple chemical sensitivities. She went to school across the street from a field where they farm, would, uh, they, they grew um, uh, corn, and when they do the aerial spraying of the field, she would get such severe airway constriction that she couldn't breathe. They also, when they did the sealant on the gym floor, uh, as, they're getting, as they're fixing to get ready for the, uh, for the basketball season, um, she couldn't breathe, things like this. So she would just stay home until the fumes dissipated. She was doing fine academically. She was doing fine socially. So when you have to think about this is she got, basically, she just stayed at home. She didn't need a, need a special education teacher to breathe for her. But she had a major life function, breathing, which impacted her ability to participate in school. The third example, and this is going to be mildly controversial, is a relative of mine who has autism. When he was in school, in, and, and you'll appreciate this, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, he took 15 AP tests and got fours or fives on all the tests, which pissed me off because my, my kids only took like two or three, and we were happy with their threes. And so we were pretty pleased with this, but they, they got credit, things like this. Um, he was doing fine academically. He was doing fine socially. He was president of the school's Wikipedia page editing club. It was a geek school. And he was also on the school's fencing team. Not as like they're, they're putting in, they're holding in livestock. It was like jousting, things like this. He was doing fine academically. He was doing fine socially. He has autism. He didn't need an IEP. He just needed some basic accommodations on, on extra time and some tests. And the parents say, well, he's, we, he, he needs an IEP for what? For his autism. What are we going to do for his autism? We'll give him a special autism services. Like what? For autism. What does that mean? He's going to get served. So when you have to think about this, does he need, does the child need special education? And we too often forget this. Too often, and this is part of the reason why I did that school board's book, is the school board members will come to me and say, we have this kid who has a disability who needs special ed. What's a disability? He uses a wheelchair. Okay? Is he doing fine in school? Yeah. Has he got friends? Yeah, he's doing great. Why does he need, why does he need a special ed? Because he has a wheelchair. And a lot of people in a society do not understand the difference. They don't understand the difference between the one and the two-part test. Okay? But this is, this is part of the handout, but the student's disability must adversely affect 
what's going on. So that's why they need special education. Okay? And so the problem is, is we often we don't revise 504s enough. So if you can take back to revise 504s, things like this, revise them, periodically check about what's going on. Don't just write a 504 when the kid is in kindergarten and let it be that same 504 all the way through high school. Because I've seen 504s that are seven, eight years of age without, without any changes whatsoever. Okay? Revise those things. Okay? More. How to evaluate? Well, what's interesting about this is you don't need, do you have to have a medical evaluation to, have an evalu- to determine the kid has a 504 need? That kid is missing his left leg. I, we did not need to do a medical evaluation to determine that he's missing his left leg. Uh, I'm, I'm not smart on some things, but I was able to get that one done. So think about this. We have to think about, does it, does it impact what's going on? And that's what we're looking at. Okay? There, this is all part of this. Okay? I'm gonna, uh, some basic evaluation questions. Does the student have a physical or mental impairment? Does the impairment affect one or more of the major life activities? And just to let you know, uh, when we talk about major life activities, this is, this, um, I'm going to tell about my wife, um, smelling is not considered a major life activity. My wife does not have a sense of smell. I didn't know how much a benefit that would be to me in my life. Uh, I, I come back from long runs, my dog's not happy with me, or I'm uh, doing certain things that are, no, no, no it's bad. All right. Is the effect substantial? In order to be eligible, the student must have all three questions answered yes. Okay? Because you have some kids who have vision problems. Okay? And I'm betting some of you without your glasses or contacts have vision problems. You know who you are. Your first thing you do every morning is you grab your iPhone, you bring it up to your face to see what time it is. Okay? But with your glasses or contacts, you're fine. Okay? So you have to think about this. Does it affect you and, and, and is the effect substantial? Okay? More. And and accommodations are required. More, okay? No medical diagnosis is required, but if the team determines a medical assessment is necessary, then it must be done at no cost to the parents. You can't say, because I'm working with a kid who's starting school tomorrow, and he has a, um, I don't know what, I, I apologize what the disability is, but he doesn't sweat. He doesn't have the capacity to sweat. And they've put him in a building where it is not air conditioned, and in the afternoon, I, the sun on the, on the side of the building where he is at, where his classroom is located, is going to get above 85 degrees. It's just understood, but once the sun, uh, by, by the end of September, the sun has moved, so it doesn't heat up as much, but September is going to be very warm in that building. And the school district said, we don't have a medical diagnosis, so we can't move him. I said, what? He's got a disability. You know, you know this. He can't sweat. He's going to be in there. He turns his bright pink, and then he passes out. It's really, uh, it's really actually ugly to watch. And, turn, and so they said, you're going to wait for a medical diagnosis, and you're going to get this. Yeah, we're going to. No, you're not. I said, we're going to move his classroom, or we're going to get air conditioning. We're going to, do, we're going to get shade. We're going to do something to get going. So they're, they're actually, they went out and purchased some air conditioning units for this building, and they're pull, putting these extra shades. They're going to try to see how the temperature is this afternoon, um, because the temperature is supposed to get in the 90s there, and see how it is before he gets there tomorrow. Okay? You have to think about this, because you have to think about the safety and security of these kids. Okay? Need for both IDEA and 504. There are some kids out there who may have a learning disability and get an IEP under IDEA and may have a physical disability and may need accommodations under 504. Um, The Office of Civil Rights has made it clear that you should include all these in as much as possible in one document so that it's not, so parents don't have to chase down what's going on as a part of this. It makes it easier and better for them to understand where we are with this. And it really does affect where we are, okay? More, okay? Major life activity. I'm working with a kid with bone cancer right now, uh, and I, I sincerely hope this is not something you have to experience in your household, um, because she's constantly, um, she's constantly, um, well, I changed it to his so you don't understand, all right, all right? but he's, he, he breaks bones on a regular basis because he doesn't have the bone density, and is posing some problems, okay? Field trips, does a student qualify for a 504 plan? I would think so, yeah. We had to actually beg for a 504 plan from that district. This is a kid who's got cancer, suffering, things like this. And so, and, and now, we, now we have family, a family member in our family, so a young one who's got cancer, and just what they're going through and how their whole life changes. 
keep that in mind as about this. Okay, list of major life activities. It's small because there's a lot of them. I'm working with a district right now who said this doesn't meet one of the 12 major life activities that we have for 504s. There is not a comprehensive list of 504 major life activities. So if anyone says this doesn't, so it could be a brand new disability. I'm working with a kid right now, sixth grade boy, who does not have an anal sphincter. So he wears diapers. So once something enters his, his, his large in, his intestine, it just, it just goes out, right? He doesn't have any control of this. He's going to get some surgery once he gets a little older about this. But it's, we're not going to, think about all the potential disabilities that you've experienced, all these things. Some of these are kids with disabilities. If I were to lock you guys in a room for a while, you wouldn't even come up with some of these disabilities. So when I, not that I'm going to, but it's interesting about this is you have to think broadly about this, okay? Um, I'm just going to go on, okay? Okay? Keep going. Temporary disabilities, okay? My daughter, when she was younger, kept breaking her right arm. She had a bone density issue, but not real things, not big deal. Things she'd break her right arm. She was right-handed. The teacher one time came in and said, you can't write the spelling test, so we can't give you a grade. Because you're only going to have the cast on for four, four weeks, so we're not going to give you a 504 plan. Temporary disabilities count. You need to keep, make sure you honor temporary disabilities and treat temporary disabilities seriously. Because they're, they're, the kid has a disability, temporary as it may be. For fi how long do you need to have a temporary disability before you get a 504 plan? Typically, they're saying good, good, good guess is like five to six months. So if a kid's going to have something for five to six months, go ahead and write that. But you just still need to make sure that they're providing reasonable accommodations as a part of this. Okay? So accommodation plan, it's written. And it's accommodations, it's not modifications. This is what trips up districts. And that document that, we've, well, that you have access to about the difference between 504, about how to write a 504 plan talks extensively about the need for making sure it's accommodations and not modifications. Okay, more. Okay. Uh, who gets a copy? Every single person who can necessarily need this, who is on a need to know. Why I say this is a district last year um, the teacher, it was, it was five, days from, five, five days from the last day of school, first grade teacher. He missed, it he, had a he missed a meeting because he had a dental appointment. They wrote a 504 plan for a kid. Last day of school, um, uh, they, they, everyone's having this party because they made it through the year. Remember, remember how, act how excited we were last year in the old days? Yep. Yeah, I'm, 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 we'll get there again. Basically, and it said, and parents said, do you have any kid with nut allergies? No. So all these kids, people, all these kids, uh, teachers, parents brought in these Reese's peanut butter cakes. The 504 plan was for a kid with a severe nut allergy. They forgot to tell the teacher who missed it because of a dental appointment. Parent, luckily was there, saw all these Reese's peanut butter cakes, be, which I think are great things. It's a great invention, by the way, being unveiled. And whipped that kid out there and said, complain to the district about you're not training or, or providing supports for what's going on. Everyone who's on a need-to-know basis needs to understand this. This also includes substitutes. Why? Because I was with a district last year who decided not to tell substitutes about the need for 504 plans because they said it would breach confidentiality. Hey, why, what happened? Fourth grade boy who had severe diabetes where, where his blood sugar level would drop rather precipitously. Hey, he'd get really woozy, put his head down, things like this. And so he actually was, you could see his blood sugar was, was dropping. Two of his friends went up to the sub and said, he's got diabetes, he needs some help. Can we call, get the nurse? She opened up her lesson plan book that said, there's nothing written here about this. He just looks tired, let him be. 10 minutes later, they went back up to the sub and said, no, he's really having severe problems. We need to get the nurse uh, right now. She said, there's nothing here. Go back. One of the boys ran down the hall to get the nurse. And the sub said, no, you shouldn't be running down the hall. Get back here. Luckily, the nurse came down, gave the kid some, get, got the kid, found out what's going on, gave the kid some, uh, what the kid needed to get, to get his blood sugar level back up. You shouldn't rely on a 504's implementation on a, being implemented by a 10-year-old. Make sure that, that all subs who are on, they're on a need-to-know basis they understand what's going on. Make sure that they get that and they understand where we are at this. Okay? I'm going to skip on to the next one. Uh, service animals, last thing. Writing a book right now on service animals. It's fun. 
It's fun. Um, the section I wrote the other day was on the difference between a service dog and a service horse. Somebody like, service horse? Yes, there are these horses that weigh between 60 and 80 pounds. And they're much more economical than service dogs because horses, service horses can live 35 years and provide up to 20 to 25 years of service. You're not going to get that out of your dog. Okay? So yes, you might be seeing some service, service horses showing up in your schools. You heard it here first. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. And service horses, they're, they're fine being bored. You can tie them up in the back of the classroom. They'll just stand there for hours. Try that with a dog, okay? I'm not advocating you guys go getting your horses, by the way. Things like this, okay? Is the animal required because of a disability, and what work is the animal trained to perform? You're going to see a lot more on service animals, and this is something that's coming your way, things like this. But I'm going to give you some advice on this. Do you want, you want to take your animal somewhere that you like? You can go on the Amazon and buy yourself a uh, service animal vest and have it sent to you. No one can ask you otherwise. There's not documentation required. The laws relating to service animals are so loose right now about who can train, who can provide, who can say what they have a service animal. It's really sad. Okay? So we're going to expect some clarity on this in the future. Okay. Switching topics. Oh, hi. It's my new favorite blood type. Okay. You're going to see a lot of kids being diagnosed under other health impaired. And this is, this, is a, this, is, this is a growing category. For those of you who are here in here for the trauma session, um, you're, you, you see we're going to have some kids potentially who have, who have issues who are going to get this, get this diagnosis because they don't neatly fall into other categories. So uh, other health impaired. So when I talk about this, 504 to IA, worsening medical conditions may need to, to educational needs. You're going to see some kids with some worsening medical conditions. What do we mean by this? Well, that depends on whether they need edu have educational needs as a part of this. Um, and and, and we were, we've seen some kids with some long-term impact on COVID as a result of this on their breathing issues, their inability to walk down the hall, their inability to participate in some of the activities, the ability sometimes even to articulate what's going on because they're having such lung capacity issues. I, like, uh, when I, I had COVID in November, when I had, I, and my wife kind of liked it because I couldn't talk very well. I had to sit there and be very quiet because my, my lung capacity was, I was, I was, it was truly, it was after a bad fall, a bad accident that I had just a few weeks before I it. So it was, it was a fun month. But it was interesting about this is I, I couldn't talk. And I, I had trouble just gather, gathering my voice as a part of this. And, and, and lung capacity is something I, I'm proud of. I'm, I'm a bike racer. I race bikes. And you need lung capacity. I, um, so it's, it's, it's tough. Right? More. More. I, I, oh, hi. Don't go solely by the disability label. Do not go solely by the disability label. Uh, because this is something that I, I, I'm going to say multiple times during the course of these two days here, is I really don't care about the disability label. For me, disability label is not a fighting issue. It really is not a fighting issue. It's a fighting issue for a lot of parents. And my, do my goal is to get kids in the door so that they can start receiving services. And the present levels dictate what we're going to provide for the kids. Because there are some kids with autism who are going to get the exact same thing as some kids with learning disabilities, who are going to get the exact same as some kids with mild intellectual disabilities. Or, some, as, or the same as some kids with traumatic brain injury. There's a variety of things as a part of this. So when we talk about this, the needs of the kid drive everything. The label, that just, that's a gatekeeping function for me. Get the kid in the door. Just focus on this. Truly, it's, it's not worth fighting. It really is not worth fighting. Just get the kid so that you can start providing the, the necessary services for that child as a part of this. Okay. Don't, so don't go solely by the educational, the disability label. Go more about this. More. Look, uh, does, the, does the disability affect learning? And, 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 and I, I apologize. It actually should say more than just learning. Does it also impact their functional performance? Because too often we solely focus on academics. We need to think broadly as a part of this. Because the, the federal regulations 
are very clear that functional performance is something that we need to pay attention to as a part of this. So don't just go solely by the academic problems the kid is having. Look also at the issues that the child is having as a result of this and pay attention to this. Okay? Chronic? Consider OHI criteria. Chronic or acute health condition. Okay? Do they have a health condition? And just think about this. Now, the biggest category we often see under OHI is ADHD. And so, because ADHD, uh, there was some discussion in 1990 uh, when, with the reauthorization of IDEA. In the old days, we used to reauthorize IDEA. We don't do that anymore. Right? But it, it was, it was, we're gonna, there was, we came really close to adding, uh, there was a lot of discussions to adding ADHD as a category. We added that same year, we added uh, traumatic brain injury and autism as categories. Not that they're, they're, we had kids with, you know, with TBI and autism prior to that, but they weren't special education categories. There was a discussion about adding ADHD as a category. But the realization was that the vast majority of kids with ADHD don't fall under the second part of the two-part test, where they, 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 may need, they may have a disability, but they don't need special education. So that's why it wasn't added. And it was, we're also we're trying to imagine what an ADHD classroom would look like. So just let your mind wander on that one, okay? So things we're looking at for some kids, yeah, yeah just yeah, come back, all right? Limited strength, problems with vitality, problems with alertness. What are the issues that we're dealing with as a part of this, okay? And do they need special education and related services? So one thing we look about is, is yes, there are kids out there who have disabilities, but they don't need special education services. And those examples I gave you early, or earlier can help clarify this, okay? 504, I'm keep circling back to 504 because a lot of the lawsuits I was involved in this past year were 504 related. And 504 is rear, it continued to rear its head. The problem with is you don't see a lot of 504 litigation because it takes often two years from when a parent files an OCR complaint as opposed to a due process hearing when we have really strict timelines. Really strict timelines for a due process or even a state complaint. You have very strict timelines about what they're supposed to do as a part of this. But for 504, not so much. So you don't hear a lot about 504 issues. But we need to do a better job of this and, and pay attention to this. But students' grades might start to stop, no longer participate in classes, absences. Staff recommends alternative education, things, things like this. Think about this. Probably with COVID, you've seen a lot of these things with kids. And we have to think about this as a part of this, OK? And so keep that in mind, OK? Right? So how do, you make a, how do we determine this? Be, make sure you have data. Uh, you're going to hear me say this multiple times. You can probably keep count of how many times I say use data. But it's interesting about this is you need to have data. Because if you don't have data, it doesn't count. And I, I seriously, when, I, when, I go to do, when, I, when a district con contacts me for a due process hearing, I say, show me the data. If they don't have data, that's, that's, I'm, I'll cut your, cut your costs right now. Just go ahead and settle real fast. Because without data, you can't make an informed decision about anything. So we have data about the kids' grades, the data about the kids' participation, number of absences, the number of times the kid goes to the nurse, all these kinds of things. And I'm not violating HIPAA by saying how the kid goes to a nurse a whole bunch of times, because I'm not asking what the kid does with the nurse. I'm just saying that the kid goes to the nurse a lot. So keep that in mind as a part of this, okay? But emphasize for all kids as a part of this. Emphasize LRE. Make sure that we're providing least restrictive environment for these kids, okay? But basically, you open the 504 IDA be considered, but make sure when you get this, when you talk about this, that you have the necessary people in the room to make an informed decision about what's going on with them, that you really truly have what's going on, okay? So that's why you may have to ask for others who are specialists in this area or call for consults from others, from other districts who may have experience with this. And with, with this, this, that new function called Zoom, you can get them to participate. You can get them. They may be doing Sudoku on the side, but they're going to be they're there for part of it. Right? I, I have a friend who participates, and when he participates, he says he participates better if he's ironing clothes. He stands there and irons clothes, and he participates. I, I mean, not so much, as you can see. All right? Okay. All right. Next, service animals. I, I alluded to this. All right? Service animals are changing topics rather dramatically, right? Service animals, I, I, I baited you with that when I was talking about horses versus dogs. I'm not going to, come in here, you do not get a service animal to take home. All right, all right, all right. Okay, things like this. Here, do not 
write a service animal into an IEP. Okay? District wrote a service animal into an IEP two years ago. Service animal got hit by a car. Parent came to school the next day and said, oh, you guys need to get us another service animal. You guys do a lot in your districts, but acquiring animals for service is not something you should do. Okay? So, and it says here, caveat, unless necessary for FAPE, I still wouldn't, I would not write a service animal. Because what you need to think about is what does the service animal provide? What service does that animal provide? And think about how that service can be provided in case the service animal is sick, has to have surgery, is, is um, sleeps in, whatever. Okay? Can you imagine a service animal sleeping in? Okay. But it's interesting. But yeah, so think about, do you need to provide aid support, provide professional support, additional instruction, additional whatever? What do you need to do so that kid can participate in the school and be what, active in where we are with this? That's important because if the service animal doesn't come or something happens, you still have to make sure that kid is receiving a free appropriate public education. So if you have a family who recommends or, or asks to bring a service animal, ask what the service animal is going to do. And then make sure that you have the staff and training to provide those supports for that kid. Now, increasingly, and make sure you understand, there is a huge honking difference between a service animal and an emotional support animal. There are kids out there who want to bring emotional support animals to school. There, no, don't do it. No, okay? I, I would love to bring an emotional support. I have a border collie. He, he would come with me. He'd, he'd probably heard me while I'm walking around up here. But it's interesting about this is no, emotional support animals are not service animals. There's a big difference. If any of you ever have an issue with this, don't hesitate to contact me. I'll send you the clear definition between the two so that you understand what's going on. Because you, uh, emotional support animals are not service animals. You do not have to make the same accommodations for this. Because I'm betting many of you have pets who make you feel good. Right? Yeah, right? When I get home tomorrow, my dog will greet me as if I have returned from the dead. Okay? If I go, for a, if I, if I go to take the trash out, I'm gone five minutes. He greets me as if I've returned from the dead. Oh, you're back. This is so wonderful. I need that. I need that. Because my teenager, my, it's my teenager, when they were teenagers, did not do that. Okay? So I, I get that from somebody. Right? More on service animals. Okay? Check. Okay? Check to make sure that the animal is individually trained to work with the kid. Hall horror. You cannot require documentation on the training of the animal. Increasingly, to save costs, Parents are training the animal themselves, which is completely and totally legal. Okay? The training the animal receives directly relate to the disability. So ask, you can ask, what is the service animal going to be doing for this child? And whatever that service animal, make sure you have it written in the IEP that you can provide those supports because you are on notice that that kid needs those services. You're on notice that kid needs those services. Make sure you've got it there for the child, right? So types of assistance. There are some animals that are soothing, okay? okay? There are some animals, be, and, and this is different from an emotional support animal. There are some kids out there truly with anxiety issues who need an animal to help soothe them and calm them down. Alternative would be that you would work very closely with a school counselor or social worker to provide them opportunities to engage with them on a relative, a, a, a frequent basis or remove themselves from stressful situations. So many of you probably remember tests where you needed soothing. Okay? So you have to think about this. Is what, what, think about this. You've got this? Okay. Make more. Merely soothing a child is not a task. You need to recognize problems and help with the nudging, barking, or, or removing the student. Okay? Just coming up and nudging against you? Yeah, my dog can recognize when I'm not happy. Usually it's when I use his middle name. Okay? But to keep that in mind, okay? miniature horses, they're cute. They're between 60 and 80 pounds. And for some kids with mobility issues, they're right here. They're, they're, you can't see this. I'll see they're, 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 they're about this high. Okay? And the kids who can lean against them, and they're very stable. And it works really well for these kids. Right. Consider the white size and safety issue in the school. How, the, how is the horse going to get to and from school? Going to hop on your bus? 
just play, just play this out. Just go ahead and play this out. It, I, I can see your minds are wandering. I got the hell. Okay, okay. There are some animals we're seeing service monkeys. Don't do it. If there's any way you can, if, uh, uh, things like this. The, uh, the service animal industry is recommending not to use monkeys because they, um, the problems with spreading of diseases. Uh, not that we need help with spreading of diseases in school right now, but there are some problems with that. Okay? Okay? Uh, okay? Are there specific breeds? Nope. There is not a specific breed. Okay? And you cannot discriminate based on the breed, size, or weight. Though, all right? The animal needs to be under control. Okay? I'm working with a district last year, two years ago, three, in the pre-times. Kindergarten kid, about this tall, wanted to bring a St. Bernard that weighed 180 pounds as a service animal. Okay? That kid had no control whatsoever of the animal. So they, the school staff are not responsible for providing or training a handler. Okay? Needs to be tethered or harnessed. Okay? Okay? Now, educational benefit, is this better than an aid? And that's, that's, a, that's, a, hard, that's, a, hard, that's a hard thing, but you need to get some data. Can you, and so you need to continually offer at every time with the parents is I, I appreciate your, your child needs a service animal. We would like to try some alternatives, if possible, of providing an aid or doing these kinds of other things with the child. Okay? It's very real. Okay? More. Okay? Uh, uh, so uh, what do you need to do? Train the staff how to handle what to do with a dog if it comes. I'm working with a school district right now. We have very small school districts in Pennsylvania where this, when I say how small, um, You'll appreciate this, and this, this could save your district a lot of money, so maybe you should consider this, is the elementary, middle, and high school are all one building. It saves on transportation costs. You should, guys should consider this. Um, but what's interesting about this is they only have one, kinder, they have, they have one first grade classroom. They don't have two first grade, it's just one first grade classroom in this whole district. The graduating class is about 17 to 18 students per year. Kid brought a service animal to school last year in first grade, and there was a kid in the classroom who was allergic to the dog. The needs of the kid with a service animal trump, I'm excuse, I should use a better word. The needs of the kid of the, of the service animal supersede the needs of the kid who's allergic. So we worked out some settings, things like this, and we um, luckily one of those kids moved at the end of the year, but I'm not sure what we're going to do this year. Okay? Work physician aligned calming functions with independence, allow service animals to attend school functions. Uh, it's great. Okay? Okay? What, if they, what if the kid can't handle the dog or horse? It's not the school district's responsibility to handle the dog or the horse. And if the dog or the horse causes destruction, that dog or horse can be removed and prevented from coming back. Okay? Very easy. There's a lot of case law on that. It's very clear on this. Very clear on this. So it's not once you get a dog, the dog can have come run amok. Because last, last, I, I, last time I flew, I was, I was uh, early June, there was, I was in the Charlotte airport, and there's a the guy who said, that's my service animal. The dog was doing loops. Just running around like crazy. There ain't no stinking service animal. I know service animals. Okay, things like this. Okay. Uh, if, if the student can't handle it, parents or a trained handler, not the school. So parents can pay for a handler to come to school. I don't see that happening. Okay. Now, finally, okay. Do a dog bites someone? Handler responsible as long as it's not provoked. All right. So if the dog just kind of just, just randomly bites someone, yeah, done. Okay. Dog has an accident, define accident however you want. Okay? The handler is responsible. It's not the teacher is responsible. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay? So I hope this has been the reason I'm saying this is I read, I can't tell you how many times I've been reading about service animals causing problems for school districts. Okay? Change of topic. Buses. I'm in favor of buses. I like buses, especially the yellow ones. Things like this, okay? But what is important about this is you need to pay attention to making sure that you provide appropriate supports on the bus. 
and we do training on the bus. Because what happens? Let me tell you what happens. The kid has a problem on a bus because they kick, yell, scream, fight, or things like this. We put them on a three-day bus suspension. Do you know what the kid does during that three-day bus suspension? They go home and they go to YouTube and they, they Google every single video out there on how to appropriately ride a bus. And for those three days, they watch all these bus videos about how to ride the bus appropriately, and they come back after a three-day bus suspension, and they've learned everything they need to know about riding a bus, and they're good. Right? Wouldn't that be nice if that happened? Okay? Okay. So a bus suspension can be a denial of faith. The kid can't get to school. You've got a problem. So what we have to think about this. So I have a questionnaire that I, that I think is part of the packet. And, and I'll, let me ask a representative. Gail, where are these things? I, I emailed Marcy on Saturday. Why I'm telling you this is I have a questionnaire for IEP teams relating to transportation. Because too often we just say a kid doesn't need transportation or doesn't things like this. You need to think about all the level of supports a child may need for transportation. And it goes into great detail for kids with extensive needs, especially like if you have a kid who wears a harness on the bus. Who's going to be responsible for putting the kid in the harness? Who's going to be responsible if the harness, are you going to have the right tools to take the, the, the harness off in case it gets locked? Who's responsible for um, this, the kid's uh, medication being transferred from one location to the other? Who's responsible uh, to, if the kid is being dropped off and there's not an adult there to receive the child? These are questions your IEP team needs to ask as a part of all transportation issues. Some kids need special transportation training. So this questionnaire gets into this. It's an appendix in a book that's coming out in a few weeks, but I, I sent it to you as a PD, as a, I think a Word document, so adapted to whatever might be benefit your school district. It was because I was involved in a lot of, a lot of um, uh, cases where they did not consider transportation as a part of meeting the child's needs, and it really did pose a significant problem. So I share this with you, is it can be, a, it could be because we don't do appropriate training on this, appropriate supports, or we haven't asked the right questions as, as a part of this. Now, I'm working with a school district right now in Delaware that can't get bus drivers. They can't get enough bus drivers, so they're paying the parents to drive the kids to and from school. And parents think they've won the farm because they get the, 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 the 40, 47 cents per mile each way, and, they're, they, and they're, they, they think they're, they're, doing, they're doing that four times a day, like 16 miles times 40. So that's eight bucks just to drive the kid to and from school. Woohoo! All right? So keep that in mind as a part of this. Okay? There are some kids who are afraid of riding the bus. And you need to think about this as an issue, as a part of this. Why are, why are they afraid? What's causing their problems? What's preventing them? Okay? So what I'd recommend is observe the child as unobtrusively as possible to see what you can do and learn about this. And increasingly, buses are, are, have CCTVs on them. And use that to kind of analyze the footage, and if, you, if you can, as what's going on as a part of this. Uh, CCTV does not, is not a, is not a cure-all. It's a, it's a great fail-safe later to document what you have, but you can't use that as the sole prevention of what's, if you need, need supports about this. But pay attention before, during, and after what's going on with this, okay? For some kids, the fear of riding the bus, is it the noise of the bus? Is it the length of the bus? Is it the other students? Is it, um, um, I, I remember riding a bus, and the uh, bus driver always made sure that we had to have all the windows all the way shut. I went to school in Virginia and North Carolina, and it was hot in the summers, when we, and, and, and June when we go to school. And we'd get really hot, and we'd ask to open the bus. We'd open the window to get some breeze, and she would yell at us. And so is, it, is there fear, fear of this? Keep this in mind, right? Now, what we have to think about this is we also need to provide instruction relating to bus. There are many kids who have failed bus on the way to school and are not allowed to participate in anything academic, but that we have nothing listed in their part of their IEP that provides them instruction relating to this. So when I say we need to provide instruction, we need to think about what is setting them up for failure that is allowing them, to, that's continually having them miss school, okay? So, so basically, bus, and there's four steps to riding a bus, okay? Waiting for the bus, getting on the bus, sitting on the bus and leaving the bus, four steps. And you have to provide instruction for some of these kids because some of these kids ain't good about waiting for the bus. 
Hey, I remember I, 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 for years I taught sixth graders, fifth and sixth graders, boys with learning disabilities and behavior disorders. And I remember traveling in Great Britain one summer and watching people line up for the bus queue. And I think, my kids could never do that. They would punch, scream, beat each other, who knows what would happen, things like this. So we taught bus behavior. We went out and practiced bus behavior. They thought it was, they thought it was, a, they thought it was ridiculous, but those kids learned what they needed to do, things like this. Appropriate manners, dealing with others, calm techniques or distractions. Some of these kids need calming techniques on the bus. Uh, my daughter works with kids with really significant needs related to autism. One of the kids she works with, he has a, a bottle that he spins on his finger. Yes, he's self-stimming the whole time. I'm aware of this. But it allows him to not kick, scream, or yell while he's on the bus. He sits there. It calms him down. Calms him down, things like this. He either has that or he has a koosh ball. He sits there and squeezes a koosh ball like this. So they make sure before he gets on the bus that he has his bottle and his koosh ball. And that, that's fine. He can, ride, he can do the bus ride after uh, things like this. You have to think about these things for these kids. What needs to be done as a part of distraction? Okay? Again, routines. Make sure that there's similar kinds of routines because some of these kids are, are, are fixated on the routines. And as I said, the, the four parts, the beginning, the middle, end, or time of day, what is causing the problems for this? So if you've got a kid who's having problems with bus riding or having things like this. We often think about solely as the academic things. When they get to school and when they leave school, bus is a huge thing that many of these kids are failing. And we have kids being removed constantly from school as a result of this. And so you have to think, what can we do? Is it, is, is it a problem at the beginning of the day? Is it a problem in the middle of the day? Because I'm working with some kids right now who are, who are at the beginning of the day don't have calories because no one's at home to feed them. And so they're getting on the bus, they're hangry. Okay? And so, luckily we had Taco Tuesday today, so I'm not hangry, but we're, we're, they're, they're hangry. Then, or, or is it the middle of the day, or at the end of the day, what, what is, the, is the time of the day causing problems, all right? Then LRE, the last thing, is make sure that we're not discriminating against these kids, that they get every opportunity, if possible, to ride the regular population, regular bus as everyone else. I was working with the school district uh, three years ago, where they had a policy that all kids eligible for special education had to ride a special education bus. Okay? And this became an issue because the special ed bus, and you'll appreciate this, there was a, there was a pair of fraternal, uh, fraternal twins, ninth grade fraternal twins. Um, the kid eligible for special education got on a bus 20 minutes before his brother, rode all the way around the county, and got to school 20 minutes after his brother. And all he wanted to do was sleep in a little bit more. That's all he wanted to do. And he was upset. And at the end of the day, he left school 20 minutes before his brother and got home after his brother. So he'd, he'd missed like the pep rallies and things at the end of the school day. The reason why he had to ride the bus? Because he was in special ed. Did he need to ride the bus? No, he did not need to ride the special bus. He, was, he, was, he had uh, mild intellectual disabilities. He was a backup guard on the football team. He could get up and down the bus. There was not an issue. He just wanted to ride the bus with his brother. Decisions were being made based on his disability label, not on his individual needs. So make sure you pay attention to the individual needs the child presents, not on a label that goes across a disability category. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay? Next. Change of topic. Gen ed teachers. God, I like them most of the time. There's sometimes they just piss me off. What's the sign for piss? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, all right. Okay. So I started talking about this, right? But what I say this is you need to make sure these are your front line of defense for problems, right? Because many of you, those of us in special ed, remember, we, you have to go to back to school night. But on back to school night, I remember this. I would go, I would go there. No one ever came to see me because they'd come to see their general education teacher. Because that's who their teacher was. So I'd hang, out in the, I'd hang out in the library with the PE coach and the librarian. We had a good time, but I had to be there. Okay? I, I think it's because I just held such great humdinger IEP meetings with them that they didn't need to spend more time with me. That's, that's why, things like this. But people, the, the, general popula the parent population thinks that the general education teacher is their main teacher. Or some like, special, in most cases, just as someone else who provides some supports, not their main teacher. But they are our front line of defense. So what do we need to do about them, okay, Jenna teachers? We need to keep them informed of all changes, all needs, and all supports necessary. Okay? 
And so that, and most, 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 and I, and I fault higher ed, as a faculty member in higher ed, I fault higher ed for this, is we do a very bad job of training general education teachers to understand what their role in the IEP process is. Okay? I, 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 I take responsibility in part, uh, not the ones I train, but the rest of higher ed. Okay? When I say this is they don't understand. We say, oh, it's in the kid's IEP. They don't understand what an IEP is. They don't understand how important it is, and they don't know where to look for an I, things like this. So make sure that your special ed staff let the general education teachers know where in the IE, what, what they need to be doing as a part of the program, what they need to pay attention to, and what they need to address as a part of this. Okay. Then why is this important? Is that general education teachers educate most kids with disabilities most of the time. They're, they're there. Whether you like it or not, and the numbers, the numbers have been increasing. Okay? Whether you like inclusion or not, most kids with disabilities are educated most of the time in the general education classroom. Okay? It's just a truism. Okay? The problem is, is society doesn't understand this. And general education teachers don't understand this. The pro also, is they're, they're more than willing to make all sorts of accommodations for a kid who um, has thick glasses, kid who has crutches, kid who uses wheelchairs, kids who have Down syndrome. Okay? There are all sorts of, but a kid who has a hidden disability, not so much. Okay? Not so much. I mean, there's a lot of teachers out there who firmly believe that LD stands for lazy and dumb. And so it's, it really does pose a problem. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm sad to be, and it's sad that we have this kind of acknowledgement. Things like this. So about the IEPs, give them copies of the relevant sections of the IEP. So what I, I mean, there, you, you can use IEP at a glance or something like this. I, I, I'm a huge fan of highlighters. Highlighters, right? But increasingly, I'm having teachers sign off that they understand what their job, their responsibilities are. So I think I, I forwarded a document as part of the handouts. A document is part of this. You've, you, you understand, you've read the relevant sections of the IEP, you understand what's part of this. You date, they have the teachers date and sign these things. Because we need to have teachers as part of this. Full description of responsibilities include teachers and IEP goals. Why is this important? Okay. I have a teacher I walk my dog with. She has another border collie, so we're, we're, our, our, our dogs hang out fine. We're good, we, we're, they're off leash, we're, we're okay. We're good dog owners. What's interesting about this is she is an eighth grade math teacher. And she has, um, she, and she, we, 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 she's starting school tomorrow. And she had a meeting last week with, our, with her staff and she, and, uh, and she realized in one of her classes, she has 23 kids, 19 of them have IEPs. Okay? And 19 of these kids have a notebook check with the teacher before they leave the classroom. So, there, so what we propose as we're walking around the field with our dogs is that she's going to teach for five minutes. And then she's going to line the kids up. And for the next uh, 48 minutes, she's going to go through a notebook check because that's what time things like this. She was not involved in the IEP discussion. She says, how am I supposed to do this? So we're, we're, she actually, we're going to do a lot of cooperative learning and co-op groups. She's going to uh, uh, do some spot checks kinds of things, but not every kid every day. She was not part of this. Her husband is all, she's the ninth grade teacher in the building that's actually attached to, the, attached to this. He's there and he's supposed to, as part of his class, um, greet the students as they walk in the classroom, get ready for his next class, but also monitor the intersection that is close to his classroom because that's where a lot of fights are. He says, how am I gonna monitor the intersection while I'm greeting the students and getting ready for my next class? So I, if, if, I drive to be in three places at once, but it's written as part of these things. We need to make sure that we provide supports for teachers so that they can do their job. They can be part of what's going on, okay? But make sure they understand their responsibilities and what does this really mean as part of this. Encourage them, strongly encourage them to be part of this. Let them know that they can ask for help. Too often general education teachers don't get the assistance about this. Check with them. We often, too often, the same thing we do, and the gen ed teachers, okay, think about this. The same thing we do with technology, the same thing we do with aides or para, um, um, paraprofessionals, and the same thing we do with general education teachers, is we give them technology, and then we don't evaluate whether it's working three or four weeks later. We give the kid a paraprofessional aid. We don't evaluate if the kid needs it three or four weeks later. We, 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 get, we send the kid back in a general education classroom. We don't see if it's working three or four weeks later. 
So what we need to do is we need to evaluate these things, not just place and pray it works, evaluate what's going on and determine if it's successful or not. By doing that, we can be a heck of a lot more better for the children as opposed to think about what's doing with them. Because I was working with a kid last year, ninth grade boy, who has, um, he has uh, fine motor issues. He had a st uh, stroke in utero and his other hand is not very strong. And so he can't type really well. So they gave him a, a, a speech to text uh, device that is, is, that he, um, um, program that he added on his computer. At no point did anyone show him how to use it. At no point was there any guidance. At no point was there any assistance. And at the end of the first marking period, he hadn't turned in papers because he couldn't type things. And the district said, oh, we're just going to fail you on all these classes. Right? He wanted to stay a member of the, of the school's football team, but no, he got, he got uh, academically ineligible because he couldn't participate with, he's a kicker on the football team. He couldn't participate on the school's football team because he was academically ineligible. We set him up for failure. So when I talk about this, place these kids, place these things with kids and then determine if they work and determine if they're still needed or if something else better or different is necessary. Don't just assume that this magic bullet is going to solve all the things and, and pay attention to what's going on. Okay? Are there obstacles? Are there problems? Okay? For all implementation, pay attention to this. Support. Okay? Provide support for the teachers. Do they really implement strategies for the 26 other, with other 26 other students in their classroom? We write some amazing IEPs. Okay? The longest IEP I've seen of late, you'll appreciate this, was 119 pages. Okay? Second place, 102 pages. Yeah. Parents are increasingly demanding that IEPs be written kind of like lesson plans. That is not the goal of IEPs. And gen ed teachers do not understand what we need to pay attention to as a part of this. But can a teacher really implement all the goals, all the steps that we write in these IEPs if they're responsible for all these kids? And if they can't, what good are we doing? We're setting these kids up for failure or just making ourselves happy that we have a paperwork compliance document that end, 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 ends up not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So keep that in mind as a part of this. Okay. Next topic. Change colors on topics. That's how I know. Okay. Individual health plans. Okay. You're going to be dealing with kids with health plans. This is something that's part of the new normal as a part of this. Something that you need to pay attention to. Okay. Um, a health plan is not enough. It's an indication that basically, basically you need a kid may need a 504. So I would, I would basically incorporate all the information as a part of the health plan into a 504 as a part of this. Okay? And so we, we talked about 504 a few minutes ago, but make sure that you include the information that is necessary and that all individuals necessary get the documentation. Because as a parent of a child, who I did not know this by the way, who went to school, who was severely allergic to bee stings. Okay? The, the, his kindergarten classroom had this great clover patch next to it, and they were out romping around looking for four-leaf clovers. And they were having a great time. My son got stung, and his foot swelled up. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being hyperbolic. It was truly. There was no way he could have gotten If he, he, he tied his shoes together, like cut out, he was not going to get it. He, he couldn't walk, and he was having trouble breathing. We did not know this. Okay? So we, so we got a health plan for him as part of this. And find, luckily, luckily we, we, we were able to get some, um, some treatment for them about this, and he's, 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 it's lessened. But it's, it's happened sometimes in, in weird circumstances for him. But we have to think about, make sure everyone's aware of this. He was out there with a classroom aide who should be aware of all the needs and health potential needs that these kids have. And keep this in mind as about this. Okay? 504 development okay? is not as intense as IDEA. I've said that before. It's because they tend to be shorter. If only need is to follow a plan for administration of medication, say, see, at see attached health plan. Um, you're going to see increasingly uh, needs. Because many of us, when we went to school, the main form of sustenance when we had lunch was peanut butter and jelly. Okay? It truly really was. I'm, I'm aware of this. The number of kids now with nut allergies showing up in your schools is through the roof. And, I, and it's, it's posing a significant problem. And if you've seen a kid with a nut, an allergic reaction to nuts, you do not want to see it again. It, it, it's truly, it's truly sad. It's truly upset in what's going on, and so I. So you need to make sure that you have supports for this, okay? But you need to make sure you have a team knowledgeable about the student, 
a knowledge of what, what's going on, okay? That you've provided the supports, you've paid attention to supports, you've paid attention to where we are with this, and you've addressed these things like this, okay? And you change it and you analyze it annually. You analyze it annually. And so just it's not just something, as I said before, you write and leave go and let, let it go. No, things like this. But as a part of your annual analysis, you need to make sure you actually, is the child IDEA eligible? Okay? Just kind of rule this sucker out. Just rule it out and pay attention to this as a part of this. Okay? And, and are there small changes necessary? Things like this. Okay? Next topic. Yes, I'm going to start talking faster. Okay? Okay? And I can't tell you how much I want you to do more of this off. I, I, I absolutely mean this. Is more behavioral data collection. Because um, we collect, we collect um, all sorts of academic data from all many different places. We have, in fact, we have academic data out the wazoo. We have very little behavioral data. And that's what trips up a lot of these kids, is the, the behavioral data, things like this. So, uh, and there's many different forms of behavioral data. And I'm not sitting and talking about long things. I'm talking about a series of snapshots, things like this, okay? So, like, like referrals, okay? Uh, these kids, we're, we're doing a lot of referrals. I, I want to see the behavioral data on the referrals. I want to see the issues relating to this. I want to see the number of issues. Um, like, so I, we're doing observations of kids on playgrounds. How, who do they, how, many kid, how many times do they interact with others? Or they stand by themselves. Kids who, who eat lunch by themselves. How many times these kids are going to the bathroom? How many times these kids are going to the nurse? How many times these kids are going to the principal's office? Behavioral data collection on a variety of things. Because if this is, this is truly what's tripping up districts. I had an IEP meeting at 11.45 today. I was, um, it, was a, it was a great time, things like this. We have a kid who's known for biting teachers. Okay? And so we're placing him back in a general education building starting on Thursday. And we have an aide who's trained as a behavior support person going to be working with him. Hopefully, we'll see. Okay? Let's see what's going on. So, but we're going to keep data about what's going on. Wait, wait. So, but you need to make database decisions. If there's nothing else I want you to learn, I want you to pay attention to this. Is that when, because I do a lot of witness prep for school districts as they're, as they're fixing to get ready for a due process hearing. And I want to see the data that informs your decision making process. How did you determine this kid needed more time in this classroom? How did you determine this kid needed more uh, social skills instruction? How did you determine this kid needed a special transportation? Show me the data as opposed to, we just felt it was good, or this kid was weird, or this kid was strange. I need data. I need numbers. And I know this takes time, but you need to train your paraprofessionals and aides on how to take behavioral data. And make sure this like this. I'll give you and I, and, and, and just and there's different ways of taking behavioral data. I was working. I was doing frequency counts. I was I was working with a uh, paraprofessional two years ago on taking frequency counts about what's going on in a classroom. And what was interesting about this is we were going to just take frequency counts on this kid who had out of seat behavior. I sat on one side of the classroom. She sat on the other. At the end, the kid had gotten out of his seat once. Okay, okay, which is correct. But he had been out of his seat for 45 of the 50 minutes. So I had, I, 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 not only did I have the, and she had a frequency count, she had her one. I got my one, right? Things like this. She was, she was exactly right, perfect. Things like this. I, had, I had also had duration, but I also had anecdotal because what is he was going around the classroom hitting people in the back of the head. So when you think about this, teach, you can, there's the data points that we can pay attention to, but we need to use this. But it's observable, it's objective. And this is what, it, and this is this is an unfair advantage that school districts have in due process hearings. You may not think that you have an unfair advantage, but you are in this classroom on a daily basis. When parents file litigation, they're not in a classroom on a daily basis. They don't have any sense of what's going on in the classroom. They don't have any sense. You have you have the opportunity to get data. You have the opportunity to get observable things that you pay attention to. Okay, so keep this in mind. And we're just uh, those of you who are speech paths, I like you. Just those you, on, you know who you are, because when I do when I do um, witness prep with speech paths, they have data pretty much for every market every time they work with the kids. Thank you. Right next. So what I see, I see teachers write things these down about kids. 
That kid is weird. That kid is crazy. That kid is lazy. That kid is strange. I want observable, measurable information. I don't want, I don't want, to, I don't want subjective information because it poses a problem. Okay? So, identify the behavior issue, clear definition. What does out of control really mean? And I'm betting each and every one of you probably have an understanding in your mind about what you mean by out of control. But you have to think about what can we do as a part of this. Because when, we do, when we're involved in due process hearings and a teacher says, kid is out of control, uh, what do you mean? How many times is he out of his seat? Well, he's just out of his seat a, a lot. Is he really compared to others? Well, it seems like it. Is that, is that enough to, to make sure that we should send the kid to a more restrictive placement? Those kinds of things. Okay? So basic data collection, frequency, duration, latency. Think of the audience. Think about the team that's going to be using this data. And think about what we're going to be using and how we can incorporate this. But what I also recommend is collect enough of this. Collect enough data that you have some things. So get different cycles, different days, different times, different prompts. Um, so it's not always the same time, the same day, the same, the same prompt, or things like this. So you can get multiple days, multiple things like this. Now it's hard to, it's hard, it's hard to compare that, but you have to think about what is, what is potentially causing these kinds of things and addressing these issues. Data collection is one of the most important parts of this process because it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to argue against data. The kid was out of his seat for 42 out of 50 minutes. That, that's, that's a fact. It's hard to argue against these facts. Okay? I, told, I told him seven times to sit down. Okay? You have data seven times. I told him to sit down. Things like this. So you have clear facts on these kinds of things. That is what I, so when we talk about litigation, we talk about pre preventing problems, collecting data from all these different things can solve a lot of your problems. First, it's better for the team to use this as part of decisions, but it's also better for the kid. It's better for the kid for us to understand completely and totally what's going on with the child so we can make an informed decision about where we are with them so they help address where we are with them. This is one of the things I, if I for if, like all the things we've talked about, is use data. Use data. But, but also, look at data for <coughs> when we're doing evaluations, when, we're, when we place a kid, as I said before, when we give kids assistive technology, when we uh, give a uh, kid classroom aid, or when we change something, give me some data. Because too often we come in, we make a change in the child's placement. We make a child change. Take some data three weeks later about how that's working, as opposed to thinking that's the magical cure that's going to solve all the problems about this. Okay? And the last thing I want to talk about, and I, I have slides way down, but I can get to this real fast without, without showing you, is COVID. It's been a topic, topic issue this past year. Okay? And, and Julie got it very right this morning. There's not been a lot of litigation relating to this that have floated up. But what you're going to see is things relating to implementation of issues relating to COVID and providing FAPE. So let me tell you one thing. If you learn one thing else about COVID is you document the snot out of every single trial of opportunities you have to provide services for the kids. You document every single time that you call the parents. You document every single Zoom call. You document every single time you responded to the kid. You document every time that the kid was not there for a service. You document everything. You document and document, document. I, and I say this because I'm prepping a school district on Friday for a due process hearing relating to not providing services. And I was reviewing the files this past week. And they had this great Google spreadsheet about every single time they called the parent or set up a time to Zoom with the kid and the kid was not there. I'd document this and they'd wait 10 minutes and they'd log out, things like this. Send another prompt, text the parent, this, things like this. Then they, they, then they, then they took, they took um, stuff, they took a, um, a hot spot to the family and they, set the, they, and they, they showed how the, the family how to set this up. Document every single part of this process. So when you, when, so this is, they, basically they've tried everything to get this kid involved and they have clear documentation and let me tell you it was a breath of fresh air for me it was a breath because they laid out this 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 you can like so let me put them i'm gonna put you on the witness stand you've got a kid who doesn't come to school because of covid tell me all the steps you did to get this kid involved show me your documentation because if I'm not, if you can't show it to me, you can't show it to the parents. 
You need to be able to demonstrate that and be able to demonstrate that repeatedly. So I, I, I apologize. The world I live in is a world of litigation and special education. But you have to remember, special ed is a field defined by a law. Whether you like this or not, it's a field defined by a law because we historically prevented kids from disabilities from attending school. My brother-in-law has profound intellectual disabilities. He was only allowed to go to school for one year because it was legal to prevent him from going to school. He got to go to school when he was 18 for one year. He's nonverbal. He needs help toileting. He needs help getting dressed. He doesn't need help eating. He's got Prader Willis in him. What's interesting about this is we have some issues that we have to think about as a part of this, is make sure you document this. So for every single kid, for every interaction, just assume. Parents are going to ask you through their advocate or through their attorney, what did you do as a part of this? If you can show me that, we're good. Okay? We have a few minutes left for questions. OK, so when you collect the data, how do you recommend you organize it? I recommend that you organize it chronologically. Yeah, no, I'm serious. That's a great question because that's because that's actually what we look at is this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Because what the law looks at very specifically is um, action response, action response, action response, action response, and chronologically is the way to analyze that. That's a wonderful question because too often we have to think about it, and that's easy to do. So you can just open up like a, a spreadsheet or a spreadsheet or or or, or some a Google Doc and just type, just keep typing every single response. Parent call me. This was my response. Parent call me. This is what I did. It's really easy. You don't have to do. You don't have to do any organization. But make sure you date that so it's really clear as a part of that. This is probably one of the best things you can do, is document those things and just keep notes. It doesn't have to be long involved notes. But enough so that if I were to ask you, so you say right here that you talk to the parent about ProloQ. Well, tell, tell me more about your conversation. Okay? So tell me what you said. What was the parent's response? Are you gonna, actually going to participate in getting this? Are you going to provide some training later kinds of things? Just step by step by step by step. Action response. Action response. Action response. Okay? Yeah? Yes. 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 Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Because you're, you're just letting them know that for our records, we're recording it. And that it, you're not saying it's going to be part of the child's permanent file, but we're just in case, uh, case there's questions later, we have a recording. Okay? Now, there are parents, and when you say this, this other thing about this, back to what I was saying earlier about rev.com, is we make, that, we make that transcript part of the child's permanent file. That this is going to go into the child's file as a part of this. And we make sure that we get one thing that helps assist with that is when you go around the room, identify the voice, just identify people, and when they speak, just say their, have them say their names. So uh, Smith speaking here, or, or Harris speaking, and then, then they make their statement. It makes it so much easier to read later, kinds of things. Go for it. Go ahead. The, the, um, high school students are considered minors. So they're not of the, the consent, or they don't have, the, uh, under the law, the capacity to make the decisions about whether things should be enforced or not. So it's our job to make sure that's going on. When they're in higher education, though, when they switch to college, they then have to ask for it to be applied for them, as opposed to when they're in K-12, it is the school district's responsibility to make sure it's applied to them. Correct. Yes. Yes, yes. But it has to be individual. Because what's interesting about this is one of the most common accommodations we have is priority seating close to the teacher, or priority seating. Okay? I'm working with a kid right now whose eyes receive too much light, so we hit priority seating for him is sitting with his back to the window. That's all he really needs. Okay? The other one is he's, our kid is really distracted, so we put him wherever the group is. As if, and there's, there's other kids who need to be next to a teacher, so it depends. Priority seating can change. but it does, so. Be very specific what you want about this. The other thing about this, other accommodation we see is extended time on test. I've seen extended time, unlimited time to take a test. Play out what unlimited time is. Okay? Kids in 10th grade, he has until he's like 40 to finish this test. No, that's not what we mean. So be very specific about the time, but also with notes. Some kids get copies of notes. How much copies of the note do they get? Does an outline count? Or do they need actually more, more written as a part of this? And so we have to think about all these steps. But no, they do not have to ask for it. The school district should be providing it for them. Okay?